Since we want to be right on time, without further ado, Roy Schumann. Welcome, Roy. Uh, hi, and, and thanks again for uh, coming again tonight. And as I mentioned yesterday, uh, yesterday obviously was centered on my witness testimony. Today we'll center on the role of Judaism in salvation history. Uh, as the subtitle of uh, my first book was the role of salvation in Judaism, uh, the role of Judaism in salvation history from Abraham to the second coming. In other words, from the very beginning to the very end. And then tomorrow night's uh, talk will center on the experience, first of all, on the miraculous conversion uh, um, circumstances of other Jews who have entered the Catholic Church, and also on their perspectives on what it means to be Catholic, as I shared my perspectives last night. But before I begin uh, tonight's talk proper about the role of Judaism in salvation history, I want to tie up a couple of things from last night's talk, maybe only one thing from last night's talk. Um, I mentioned that one of the questions that I had asked the Blessed Virgin Mary in my experience of her was what title she liked best for herself. And uh, her response was, I am the beloved daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Spirit. Now, we very frequently think of the Blessed Virgin Mary's role as the mother of Jesus. Uh, we know as Catholics, we should know as Catholics, that she is also the mediatrix of all graces. Um, that's a, another talk, but it's actually essentially been dogmatically established, although it hasn't been pronounced formally as a dogma, that the Blessed Virgin Mary is the mediatrix of all graces. In other words, that all of the graces that Jesus won for mankind, he distributes to mankind through the hands of Mary. And um, we think of her having this role by virtue of her being the mother of God, the mother of Jesus, but we can also think of her having that role by virtue of her being the spouse of the Holy Spirit. So I just wanted to kind of flesh that out just a tiny bit. Uh, first of all, uh, to defend that statement that all of the graces that God chooses to give mankind, he gives through the hands of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I'll just read a couple of uh, very short quotes from some saints and popes and sainted popes. Uh, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux wrote, God has willed that we should have nothing which does not pass through the hands of Mary. Uh, Pope Pius IX uh, wrote, for God has committed to Mary the treasury of all good things in order that everyone may know that through her are obtained every hope, every grace, and all salvation. Pope Leo XIII, quote, nothing of all of the immense treasury of every grace which the Lord accumulated is imparted to us except through Mary. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these definitive flat statements in, in papal documents from popes and from saints saying that Mary is essentially the mediatrix of all grace. Now, um, what's this have to do with her being the spouse of the Holy Spirit? I would argue that it has everything to do with her being the spouse of the Holy Spirit. When Mary conceived Jesus in her womb through being overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, that was an act of spousal union. That's where conceptions come from, is obviously the spousal union between the father and the mother. When Mary entered into that spousal union with the Holy Spirit, and excuse me for saying this, um, it wasn't a one-night stand. It was a true spousal union. It was the beginning of an eternal spousal union between the third person of the Most Holy Trinity and the Blessed Virgin Mary. A according to Jewish law, and you actually see this in the Old Testament, marriage takes place not because of any sacramental act you know, said over the bride and the groom, not because of anything any rabbi does. The marriage takes place through the spousal union itself. And you see this, for instance, when um, Isaac married Rebecca. It was their spousal union which produced the marriage. That's what produces marriage under Jewish law. A marriage was produced between the third person of the Most Holy Trinity and Mary when, when the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and conceived Jesus in her womb. Now, spousal unions are indissoluble. They're eternal, uh, or at the, in our case, at least until death. Um, and we know some of the properties of the spousal union, which is that um, everything that one spouse owns is also owned by the other, where basically the spouses are together all the time. They're together, the two become one flesh. The saint who wrote most beautifully about 
Mary as a spouse of the Holy Spirit with St. Maximilian Kolbe. So I'll just wrap this part up by reading some quotes from St. Maximilian Kolbe about it. The third person of the Blessed Trinity never took flesh. Still, our human word spouse is far too weak to express the reality of the relationship between the Immaculata and the Holy Spirit. We can affirm that she is, in a certain sense, the incarnation, in quotes, of the Holy Spirit. Mary is united to the Holy Spirit so closely that we really cannot grasp this union, but we can at least say that the Holy Spirit and Mary are two persons who live in such intimate union that they have but one soul life. The Holy Spirit is in Mary after the fashion, one might say, in which the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the Word made flesh, is in his humanity. There is, of course, this difference. In Jesus, there are two natures, human and divine, but one single person who is God. Mary's nature and person are totally distinct from the nature and person of the Holy Spirit. Still, their union is so inexpressible and so perfect that the Holy Spirit acts only by the Immaculata, his spouse. This is why she is the mediatrix of all graces given by the Holy Spirit. So you, you see basically what Maximilian Kolbe is saying and what is actually obvious, I think, if one stops to think about it, is that the ultimate union between divinity and humanity took place in Jesus, where uh, it's called the hypostatic union, but where Jesus had the full human nature, the full divine nature in one in a single person. The union between the Holy Spirit and the Blessed Virgin Mary is not the same kind of union. They're still two persons. But the, in, in the case of the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit, the human nature and the divine nature are, are united through the spousal union between the person of Mary and the person of the Holy Spirit. So it's second only to Jesus in a, in a union between divinity and humanity. Does that make sense? I don't want to sound heretical, and if I say this too fast, and if I say this sloppily, it may, be, it may sound like I'm saying it's the same kind of union as it is in Jesus. That's not true. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that it's second only to the union in Jesus, and it's unique. It's not like anything in any other human creature. It's, it's nothing that's ne ever been done anywhere else except in the Blessed Virgin Mary. And this is, in fact, why all of the graces that flow to mankind, which flow through the Holy Spirit, flow through Mary, who is his human spouse. That makes sense. And I, of course, I didn't know this at the time, but looking back on Mary calling herself um, the beloved daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and the spouse of the Spirit, I just wanted to flesh out just how that important that is, that she is the spouse of the Spirit. So anyway, that was just kind of finishing that thought from last night, and um, I'll go on to uh, tonight's talk proper, which is about the role of Judaism in salvation history. Um, now, the story of the role of Judaism in salvation history actually starts at the very beginning. It starts at the beginning of the creation of mankind. I talked a little bit last night about how I don't consider myself a convert at all because uh, Judaism and Catholicism are actually two phases of one, in some sense, one in the same relationship between God and man, which was intended from the beginning for all of mankind, and there was a preparatory stage, which is Judaism, so I'll just kind of start with that. So that story begins at the very beginning when God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He created man to live in a state of uninterrupted intimacy with God and bliss, no suffering, no death, no work, and so forth, from his creation for all eternity. Um, when man chose sin, when, when Adam and Eve fell, that initial exalted privileged relationship between man and God was shattered. And man fell, but at that very moment, God knew that not only would he restore man to that original exalted state at some point in the future, but he would actually raise him to an infinitely higher state through the incarnation of the second person of the most holy trinity as a man at a future point in time. Right? So God knew this from the very moment of Adam's fall. Now, if the second person of the most holy trinity was going to incarnate as a man at a future point in time, it would, of course, be in a particular place in the world, among a particular people, at a particular point in time, and even in the womb of a particular virgin. And, of course, that people would have to be prepared. They would have to be, first of all, separated out 
from all of the rest of humanity for almost 2,000 years so that they could become the recipients of a tremendous amount of divine revelation to prepare them for this task. They would have to be, first of all, taught about the one true uncreated creator God. They would have to be taught about the creation of man, the fall of man, the seriousness of sin, the need for redemption. They would have to be taught about the future coming of Redeemer. They would have to be given enough divine revelation to be able to identify the Redeemer when he came. They would have to be taught enough theology to understand what was happening and to be able to propagate the new religion to the four corners of the earth after it happened. They would have to be raised up to a level of uh, at least moral behavior so that the incarnation of God as one of them wouldn't in itself be a sacrilege. And they would have to, if you excuse the expression, breed, they would have to, over the generations, produce a virgin of such purity and nobility that she could give her flesh and blood to be the flesh and blood of the God-man when he came. And that's what the Jewish people were. They were the people chosen, one could say, at random from all of the people wandering the face of the earth for this task, for this role, which is without doubt the most most honored role ever given to a single ethnic people to very literally bring salvation to all of mankind through the incarnation of God as one of them. Right? It's only logical. Now, one can, one can ask, why on earth did God choose the Jews for this task? And there are at least three answers. There's a famous uh, quote that's attributed to a lot of different people, how odd of God to choose the Jews. And it's undoubtedly true. And why did God choose the Jews? Uh, there are at least three answers to that question. One is, he had to choose somebody, and whoever he chose, we'd be shaking our heads today and say, why on earth did he ever choose them? Another reason we know particularly well as Catholics, which is that God always chooses the most worthless and insignificant for his special tasks, his special honors, just so that it's obvious to everybody that, that this honor wasn't anything they'd earned or deserved or because they're special, but it's simply a sovereign act of the, of, uh, the grace of God. Uh, we know this as Catholics is all over in, in, in Revelation. Uh, St. Bernadette of Lourdes, who received, the, of course, the apparitions of the Blessed Virgin Mary at Lourdes, at one point said, the Blessed Virgin chose me because I was the most ignorant of all creatures. And when Jesus appeared to St. Margaret Mary Alacoc, in the Sacred Heart apparitions, and of course this is the parish of the Sacred Heart, at one point uh, Margaret Mary Alacock asked Jesus, why me? Why did you choose me for this honor? And Jesus answered, that's very simple. If I could have found anyone else more worthless and insignificant than you, I would have chosen her instead. And in fact, the, reason, the fact that this is the reason why uh, God chose the Jews is explicit in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel uh, chapter 16, uh, God says directly that this is why he chose the Jews. He compares the Jews to an infant that was considered so worthless that it was discarded after birth without even being uh, washed off of its afterbirth. And God, for no good reason, picked up this infant and raised it up for this honor. I'll read some of the passage. Thus says the Lord God, this is uh, Ezekiel chapter 16. Thus says the Lord God to Jerusalem, um, your father was an Amorite and your mother was a Hittite, and as for your birth, on the day you were born, your navel string was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor rubbed with salt, nor swathed with bands. No eye pitied you, but you were cast out on the open field on the day that you were born. And when I passed you by and saw you weltering in your blood, I said to you, in your blood, live. Um, and, uh, and I bathed you with water and washed off your blood from you and anointed with you with oil. I clothed you with embroidered cloth, shod you with leather, swathed you in fine linen, and covered you with silk. I put a ring on your nose and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown upon your head. Thus you were decked with gold and silver and your raiment was of linen. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and came to regal state. Um, and your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty, for it was perfect through the splendor which I had bestowed upon you, says the Lord God. So he's answering the question explicitly. The Jews were so, I mean, it was precisely because the Jews were so worthless and insignificant that he chose them for this honor. Now, there is a third answer, though, which is the 
the Jewish chauvinist answer, which is a positive reason why God chose the Jews, and that is reflected in the story of Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, which was the beginning of the Jewish people. I think you all know that, that Abraham is, is the father of the Jews. He was the first Jew, essentially. Um, I think you know the story. It's, it's recounted in Genesis 22, but there are a couple of reasons why I'll tell this now. It'll become apparent. So the story is that um, Abraham was a pagan among pagans. He was uh, born in the land of the Chaldeans, in the land of Ur. God came to him and called him and said, leave your land, go to where I tell you, and I will make you the father of a great nation. So Abraham left Chaldea with his wife Sarah and kept waiting and waiting and waiting for this child of the promise that God was going to give them to make Abraham the father of a great nation. Well, Abraham and Sarah were infertile. They, she could not conceive. They didn't have any children. And Abraham waited and waited and waited. Um, at one point, he gave up waiting. That's another story. And he had Ishmael, um, <laughs> and which we're still suffering from, but that's another story. Um, and then finally, when Abraham was about 100 years old and Sarah was in her 80s and long past childbearing, God miraculously gave them the son of promise, which was Isaac. And as soon as this boy grew up to adolescence, probably about 12 or 13, God turned around and said, now that I've finally given you the child, the son of promise that you've waited all your life for, I want you to sacrifice to him, me, him to me. And without a moment's hesitation, Abraham agreed. And now I'll turn to the passage from Genesis 22 and, and read this part of the story. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham replied, here I am. God said, take your son, your only beloved son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering upon one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took his son Isaac and went to the place God had told him. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on the shoulders of Isaac his son and took in his hand the fire and the knife and they both went up together up the mountain. And Abraham said to his father, uh, excuse me, Isaac said to his father, Abraham, I see the fire in the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham replied, God himself will provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. When they came to the place God had told him, Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar on the wood. Then Abraham put forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham replied, Here I am. The angel said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, Because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will multiply your descents as the stars of heaven and the sand on the seashore. And in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. That, um, that statement by the angel, Through your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, has, was always seen in Jewish theology, is still today seen as Jewish theolo in the, Jewish theology, as the promise to send the Messiah through the seed of Abraham. That is what it means when God said, in your seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That was the promise to send Jesus the Messiah through the seed of Abraham. Now that mountain where Abraham took his son Isaac to be sacrificed in the days of the Old Testament was called Mount Moriah. 2,000 years later, in the days of Jesus, it had a different name. It was called Mount Calvary. If you go to Jerusalem, you can see the rock on which Abraham bound Isaac. It's inside the Dome of the Rock on the top of the Temple Mount. You can walk about 500 yards down the mountain ridge and come to another spot on the same mountain ridge, which is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where Jesus was crucified. As Abraham took his only beloved son, laid the wood for his sacrifice on his shoulders and led him up the mountain as a sacrifice to God. Um, Jesus, uh, God took his only beloved son, you can say Jesus, laid the wood for his sacrifice on his shoulders, the cross, took him up the very same mountain as Abraham, it says, bound Isaac his son on the wood. God bound Jesus his son 
nailed him to the wood, the cross, and sacrificed him in that very same place. When Isaac asked his father, where is the lamb for the sacrifice? And Abraham answered, the Lord himself will provide the lamb for the sacrifice, my son. He was speaking prophetically far more deeply than he could ever realize because God himself did provide the true lamb for the sacrifice, the lamb for the redemption of the sins of all of mankind in that very same place when he, when he uh, provided the true lamb of sacrifice, Jesus, on Calvary in that very same place. When it says in this passage a couple of times, you might have noticed, as it is said to this day on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So Abraham called the name of that place the Lord will provide because all of this, Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac there was all a picture in advance of the true sacrifice for the redemption of mankind when the Lord would provide the lamb for the sacrifice in that very same place. That ram which was caught by its horn in the thicket and offered as a temporary substitute for, um, well, it was a substitute for Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, was a placeholder for the true lamb of sacrifice, Jesus. From that point on, every Jewish sacrificial lamb which was sacrificed was simultaneously pointing back in time to Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac and forward in time to the true lamb of sacrifice, Jesus, who would be sacrificed in that very same place. When Jews blow the shofar on their feast days, I don't know if you've ever heard that. You know that they blow a ram's horn on the new moon and on their feast days? I happen, not coincidentally, to have one here as a little show and tell. This is what they say, what they do. Sometimes it works better than others. Well, I'll lose my job as a rabbi, but that's okay. <laughs> I, I've lost it long ago. Anyway, um, when the Jews blow the ram's horn on their feast days, explicitly according to Jewish theology, they are reminding God of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac and reminding God of his promise to send the Messiah in reciprocation for Abraham's fidelity to God. So when they blow the shofar in Jewish theology, what they are saying is, do you remember when our father Abraham was so loyal to you that he sacrificed Isaac and you promised to send the Messiah? We've been waiting 4,000 years. Where is he already? That's the meaning in Jewish theology of the blowing of the shofar. So you can see maybe now why I, I told this. Oh, by the way, this is also the reason why the cover of salvation is from the Jews is actually a picture of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac because the whole story of Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac is, uh, is the archetypical illustration of how uh, it's called typology, but how everything in Judaism was a picture in advance, a foreshadowing of its fulfillment in the Catholic Church. So Abraham's willingness to sacrifice Isaac was this beautiful and exact picture in advance of what was truly coming for the redemption of mankind, which was the sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary. Do you see, do you see what, I, what I mean? I, and I, I mean, I, I could obviously talk a lot more about this, but um, when you look into it, this is actually the reason why Jesus had to be sacrificed on Passover. That's a, sort of another story. But um, everything in Judaism takes on the, the full illumination of its meaning and its meaning in salvation history when one sees it as a, a typological foreshadowing of the fulfillment in Christianity. I'll actually uh, very quickly tell what I wasn't going to tell, uh, but anyway. Um, and that, uh, the, the archetypical uh, illustration of that is the exodus from Egypt. You all know the story of the exodus from Egypt, right? The Jews were slaves of the Pharaoh in Egypt. God raised up Moses. Moses went to Pharaoh and eventually got Pharaoh to allow the Jews to leave. They, they fled Egypt, but then Moses, uh, the Pharaoh sent the army after them. They crossed through the waters of the Red Sea. The Pharaoh's army was drowned in the Red Sea. They went through the, wandered in the desert for 40 years and eventually made it to the Promised Land. Um, from the very earliest of the church fathers, uh, the whole story of the Jews' exodus from Egypt was seen as a uh, prophetic foreshadowing of our true redemption through Christ. And in, in Jewish theology, by the way, the entire story of the exodus from Egypt is seen as a messianic prophecy. And that's even, again, today within totally kosher Judaism. The story that the church fathers told is the following. The Jews' slavery to the Pharaoh in Egypt was a picture of mankind's slavery under the power of Satan. Um, the Jews' 
um, uh, fleeing from uh, uh, under the power of Satan. They were they were um, they were freed from the power of Pharaoh by passing through the waters of the Red Sea. That was a picture of the Christian being freed from the power of Satan by passing through the waters of baptism. The Jews wandered through the desert for 40 years on their way to the promised land. That's the picture of the Christian wandering, so to speak, through the desert of this life on the way to the true promised land, which is the heavenly Jerusalem. But the Jews needed something to sustain themselves through those 40 years in the desert. What was it? It was manna, the miraculous bread from heaven which was given to them miraculously to sustain them in the wandering through the desert for 40 years, which is a picture in advance of the Eucharist, the true miraculous bread from heaven, which is given to the Christian to sustain them in their wandering through the desert of this life to the true promised land, which is heaven. And this equation between the Eucharist and the manna given to the Jews in desert was, given, was made explicitly by none other than Jesus himself. I think you all know this in John 6. I may have, I think I have the, the quote there, here somewhere. Uh, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, but they died. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever, and the bread which I shall give you for the life of the world is my flesh. I mean, how much more explicit than you, can you get than that? So that's just another illustration of this role of Judaism in salvation history. And it's also a reason, by the way, for reading the Old Testament and identifying, understanding what was going on with the Jews is it's actually all a typological foreshadowing of the fulfillment of salvation history through Christ and the Catholic Church. Okay? Okay. Um, and um, I won't go on, but the culmination of this is why Jesus had to be sacrificed on Passover. But you'll have to invite me back to do a Passover Seder during Lent to, to, to get the rest of that story. Because I want to now go back to kind of the mainstream of, of what I was going to talk about tonight. The role of Judaism in salvation history leading up to the first coming of Christ is kind of obvious. But there is a great mystery to the role of salvation history in between the first and second comings of Christ. That's what I want to spend the rest of um, the time this evening talking about. So um, one can say that given that the Jews were chosen for the most honored role ever given to any ethnic group, to literally bring salvation to all of mankind through the incarnation of God as man. What a shame that they blew it and they didn't recognize Jesus when he came. But it doesn't take much of a second look to realize that Jews can't be considered to have blown it because they were chosen to bring about the incarnation and the incarnation came about. They were chosen to spread the gospel to the four corners of the earth and the, four, uh, the gospel has been spread to the four corners of the earth. There would hardly be two billion Christians in the world of which over one billion Catholics, if the Jews had failed in their task. They obviously succeeded in the task, otherwise we wouldn't have the Catholic Church and we wouldn't have Christianity. But there is a mystery to the Jews' failure to recognize Christ when he came, which I will kind of come back to in a moment. That's one aspect of the mystery of the role of Judaism in between the first and the second coming of Christ. Um, there's a, we know a number of things about the role of Judaism in between the second the first and second coming of Christ. We know things about it from sacred scripture. We know things about it from Catholic dogma. We actually now know things about it from recent statements of the popes, of which I'll give a couple. And we, um, we know something about it from history itself. So I'll talk a little bit about those, those four things. First of all, from Catholic dogma, uh, paragraph 674 of the New Catechism of the Catholic Church reads, quote, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. This is a statement of a uh, Catholic doctrine which has been held from the days of the Church Fathers that the Second Coming won't happen until there is a widespread, wholesale, if you excuse the pun, conversion of the Jews, which is what's reflected in this statement in the Catechism, and I'll just repeat that. The glorious, the glorious Messiah's coming in other words, the second coming, the, the Jesus' return in glory, is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. In other words, Jesus can't come again until there is a widespread conversion of the Jews. So that's one mysterious role we know that Jews and Judaism still have to play in bringing about the second coming. Um, the, um, uh, this has been um, underlined and I, I will just actually read a couple of these quotes just because they're fun if I have them here. Um, I, and I may or may not, and if I don't, I apologize. Um, 
uh, here. Uh, this is from, uh, from Pope Benedict. Um, uh, this is from a, a long interview he gave uh, in a book which is called God and the World. Although the Jews have lived 2,000 years in exile, their religion has not just evaporated. This is a phenomenon still without parallel in the history of mankind. It is obvious that the development of the world as a whole has some mysterious connection with the development of the Jewish people. The way that this tiny people who no longer have any country, no longer any independent existence, but led their lives scattered throughout the world, kept their own identity. The way the Jews are still Jews and still a people, even during the 2,000 years when they had no country, is an absolute riddle. This phenomenon in itself shows us that there's something more than mere historical chance at work. The great powers of that period have all disappeared. Ancient Egypt and Babylon and Assyria no longer exist. Israel remains. This shows us something of the mystery of God. So what Pope Benedict is saying is that something else that shows us that Jews and Judaism still have a mysterious role to play in salvation history is the fact of their continued existence, which is without parallel in the history of mankind. Now, and there's a third um, aspect, which is a history, which shows us something of the role that Judaism still has to play in salvation history. And what I will focus on in the history of the Jews of the last 2,000 years is, in fact, the phenomenon of anti-Semitism because um, it's clear that most ethnic groups have been hated by some other people at some point in time somewhere in the world, but there are not a lot of examples of an ethnic group that has been hated by everyone in every place in the world at every point in time, like the Jews. And I think it's actually quite evident that the continual animosity towards the Jews reflected in anti-Semitism is in itself a mysterious indication of their continuing role in salvation history and is in fact a reflection of a diabolical hatred of the Jews. I, I, I will defend that statement as I go along. Now, the most um, visible uh, manifestation of anti-Semitism over the last 2,000 years is what ha took place uh, essentially in our generation or in the generation just preceding us, which was the Holocaust in which uh, in, in, in fact, what was the most civilized country in the world, uh, Germany at the time, you can think of, you know, uh, Goethe and Hesse and Beethoven and, and Kant, and I mean, this, this was not a backward primitive culture. It was the, the height of Western civilization, uh, developed this single-minded focus on uh, freeing the world from the taint of Jewish blood by their eradication. That is pretty mysterious. And when you look into the forces and the motivation that led to the desire to exterminate the Jews in the Third Reich, you see three streams that flow together, three streams which are directly traceable to the diabolical will, three streams that evidently came, uh, excuse the expression, but directly from the pits of hell. And one of the reasons I'll talk about this is to talk about the role of Jews in salvation history, but the other reason is because we see the reemergence of those same three streams in our culture today in a very spooky and suggestive way. Now those three streams that flowed into the Holocaust, and I'll defend this statement, were occultism or Satanism, uh, eugenics, and sexual depravity. Uh, first of all, occultism or Satanism, no less of an authority than Father Gabriella Amorth, who uh, is the chief exorcist of Rome, wrote that without a doubt, Hitler was personally consecrated to Satan. So Hitler was a Satanist and he was an occultist. His, uh, his first springboard to public prominence was an occult society in Munich called the Thule Society. Thule was the Germanic version of the Atlantis myth. Thule was this mythical continent in the Atlantic Ocean where the people had these superpowers, they could travel through the air, they had mental telepathy and so forth. This continent sank under the waves of the Atlantic, but before it sank, the super race fled to Europe and there they interbred, intermingled with inferior races, polluted their blood and lost their superpowers. But if the purity of their blood could be reestablished through selective breeding, they would regain their superpowers. And that is the origin of the Nazi Superman myth that lay behind all of their selective breeding experiments, all of their attempts to rid the world of the impurity of Jewish blood, to restore the purity of the Aryan race, which was the race that had fled from Thule, and restore their superpowers. And this was, this was the myth of Thule, and it was the Thule Society, which was Hitler's initial 
place where he came to, to be known and have power and be famous. Now, the head of the Thule Society in the days of Hitler was an occultist named Dietrich Eckhart. Uh, Dietrich I. Eckhart uh, boasted, quote, I have initiated Hitler into the secret doctrine, opened his centers of vision, and given him the means to communicate with the powers. Okay? Initiation. What is occult initiation? What's it mean when he says, I've initiated Hitler into the secret doctrine, opened his centers of vision, and given him the means to communicate with the powers? Those powers were certainly not the powers of heaven. Those were the powers of hell. Occult initiation is essentially the introduction of demonic entities into the person that then do give him an ability to communicate with the spiritual world, but it's the fallen spiritual world. It's the demonic spiritual world. And this was the head of the Thule Society who boasted that he had given this ability to Hitler. If, if one were to doubt this, they could get a copy of Mein Kampf, and the very last paragraph, Mein Kampf is, of course, Hitler's memoirs. It's his his master writing work, and the last paragraph of Mein Kampf is Hitler's dedication of the work to his mentor, Dietrich Eckhart. That's still there in the copies of Mein Kampf. Now, so, so one of the streams that clearly led to this desire to exterminate the Jews was directly occultism or Satanism. Another stream was eugenics, and there was a very spooky and haunting and frightening um, almost equation between uh, Margaret Sanger and her birth control league, which of course was the direct predecessor to Planned Parenthood, and Hitler's eugenics program. Hitler was made chancellor in January 1933. Within four months, he set up the expert committee on questions of population and racial policy. That was his eugenics committee, which then came up with a scheme, which they implemented, to forcibly sterilize carriers of hereditary diseases, which was defined to include feeble-mindedness, alcoholism, and epilepsy, under which about 400,000 people were forcibly sterilized, that developed the program to euthanize disabled children, every child upon birth. The doctor or the midwife had to check off one of two boxes, whether the child should be killed or not, and over a quarter million children were killed with that, uh, under that policy. And the director of the primary German eugenics institute under Hitler was a Dr. Ernst Ruden, who was a frequent contributor to Margaret Sanger's Birth Control Review, which is the journal of the Margaret Sanger's Birth Control League. The textbook, which became the foundational text in the German school system for eugenics under Hitler, was a book called The Rising Tide of Color Against White World Supremacy. It had been written in 1920 by an American by the name of Lothrop Stoddard, who was a board member of Margaret Sanger's Birth Control League. Okay. There was a continual uh, flowing back and forth between expertise, research, and experts between Margaret Sanger's Birth Control League and Hitler's eugenics program. Margaret Sanger herself, in her own magazine, in, in the Birth Control Review, um, I don't have the date here, wrote, uh, published something she called a plan for peace where she laid out the program of concentration camps and forced sterilization. And I'll just read a couple of sentences from Margaret Sanger's own writing, her plan for world peace. To apply a stern and rigid policy of sterilization and segregation to that grade of population whose progeny is tainted or whose inheritance is such that objectionable traits may be transmitted to offspring to give genetically undesirable groups in our population their choice of segregation or sterilization, and to apportion farmlands and homesteads for these segregated persons, where they would be taught to work under competent instructors for the period of their entire lives. In other words, concentration camps. And we now have a postage stamp of Margaret Sanger, you know, this, this, this proud icon of our, our contemporary culture. The third of these streams that flowed into the Holocaust, and I'll go lightly on this, is in fact sexual depravity. Um, the director of the um, Berlin Search, uh, excuse me, the Berlin Sex Research Institute in the days of Hitler was uh, Ludwig Lenz, and he wrote that over 90% of early Nazis were homosexual. Um, the, the brown shirts, which was Hitler's informal army that bullied his way into power was formed as an explicitly homosexual division of the Fry Corps. It was formed under an uh, overt homosexual named Gerhard Rosbach, and under, in Hitler's day, it was led by another very proud and self-assertive homosexual named Ernst Röhm, Ernst Röhm, 
and the official meeting place of the brown shirts in the early days was a permanently reserved table in the biggest gay tavern in Munich called the Brostvers Bratwurstglurkel Tavern. Um, it was such a scandal that the early Nazi leaders were all homosexual that Himmler complained to Hitler, quote, does it not constitute a danger to the Nazi movement if it can be said that Nazi leaders are chosen for sexual reasons? In other words, for being part of this homosexual brotherhood. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's tons of evidence about this. It's not, it's not even contested. And I'll just, just add two little additional anecdotes. One is that to lead the Hitler Youth, you all know the Hitler Youth was uh, Hitler's organization for, um, for youth, you know, for adolescents to lead, bring them into Nazism. Hitler had released from prison a convicted pederast, Balder von, Schir Balder von Schirach, to be the head of the Hitler Youth. Uh, when I discovered this stuff, and I kind of excitedly mentioned it to my father, he looked at me kind of funny and he said, what's the big deal? We all knew that. In other words, in the 30s in Germany, everybody knew about the, um, uh, more than the homosexual element in the Nazi movement, but actually almost like the homosexual foundation of the Nazi movement. The Munich papers were full of uh, warnings to parents, don't let your sons be uh, you know, homosexually initiated in the Hitler Youth and so forth. So uh, I'm, I'm telling this, and now I'm getting off this because it's kind of obviously horribly dark, but I'm talking about this for two reasons. Um, one is because it really illustrates that the desire to exterminate the Jews was not of human origin, but it was a direct expression of, of basically diabolical will with the devil using his normal tools for gaining control over people. And it is not very heartening to find the same um, currents in society that led to this in the days of Hitler emerging as virtues and good things in our society today. So I will just go on, but I'll say, so that begs the question, you know, if the Jews no longer had a role to play in salvation history, why was it like the devil's number one agenda to rid the world of Jews, to exterminate all of the Jews? And I think a very reasonable hypothesis for the answer is that the devil also knows that there can't be a second coming until there's a conversion of the Jews. So maybe the thinking was that if there are no Jews, there can't be a second coming, and certainly if there's no conversion of the Jews, there can't be a second coming. And the Holocaust failed in exterminating all of the Jews, but it did a darn good job of forestalling the conversion of the Jews and being a huge impediment to the conversion of the Jews. So my argument is basically that it's very reasonable to think that the diabolical interest in the Holocaust was precisely to stop the conversion of the Jews and to, uh, if you excuse the expression, abort the second coming. So um, let, me, uh, let me go back to what I promised I would talk about when, when I began this segment, which is the mystery of the Jews' a failure to recognize Christ when he came, because it really ties all of this together. Um, that sounds like a rather unbelievable statement right now, but I'll ask you in five, 10 minutes whether whether I succeeded or not. Um, now, most of what we know about the role of the Jews in salvation history in between the first and second coming of Christ in scripture, or from scripture, comes from Romans chapter 11, uh, Paul's letter to the Romans chapter 11, where Paul really does a beautiful job of laying out the mystery of the interplay between Jew and Gentile in between the first and the second coming. So I want to um, kind of uh, summarize this evening's talk, and by the way, um, tonight's the only dark talk. Tomorrow gets very happy again, like last night, and the beautiful, extraordinary graces of God in what he gave us in the Catholic Church as illustrated by the conversion of the Jews and so forth. So don't despair. It's not going to get worse and worse. It's like an Oreo cookie, you know. There's, this is just the middle part of the Oreo cookie. Um, but I think it's really necessary if one wants to kind of penetrate into the the mystery of the role of Judaism in salvation history. So let me close with reading from Romans chapter 11. Um, or let me actually interrupt myself now that I'm thinking of it, because um, I got carried away and I always forget to say this. Uh, uh, <laughs> this is really an interruption, but first of all, I mean, if this stuff is interesting to you, obviously I have my books, which I have here, and they're also for sale in normal bookstores and Amazon and stuff. I have a website called salvationisfromthejews.com. Um, I have a weekly radio show on Radio Maria, which is also called Salvations from the Jews. 
which is every Saturday afternoon uh, from one to two, it would be here. And you can't, there's no broadcast station here. They have about 15 broadcast stations throughout the US, but not one in this area. But it's over, it's on the internet. And most weeks I have uh, a live interview with another Jew who has entered the Catholic Church. So it's a fun show. And um, I'm, I'm on and off, I'm on EWTN, and it just so happens that in about a month I'm on EWTN again. The week from uh, January 27th to 31st, so the last week of January, I'm on every day from um, 9 to 9.30 on a show called Women of Grace. It's a show with Jonette Benkovich. So, uh, and I, the, the title of that week's show is, um, is Jewish Roots, Christian Fruits. So at least she didn't make me a Jewish fruit. But anyway, <laughs> um, so it's, it's a discussion of essentially the, the continuation of Judaism into the, into the Catholicism. I always forget to mention that, so I figured I'd mention all of that while I remembered. So now back to Romans 11, Paul talking. Uh, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see, and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see. Okay, so Paul is introducing, well, two things here. First of all, that flat statement that God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So even though the Jews rejected God in their rejection of Jesus, God did not reciprocate and reject the Jews because the Jews had rejected him. But then Paul goes on to say something very mysterious. The Jews' rejection of Jesus was not entirely their own fault. It was not entirely due to their stubbornness and hard-heartedness. But as, as Paul says, um, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, down to this very day, let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. So somehow, mysteriously, God cast a veil over the eyes of the Jews so that they would not, in, in large numbers, recognize Christ when he came. Then Paul goes on to talk about why God did this. So I ask then, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means. But through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but light from the dead? Okay? Something very mysterious here. What's he talking about? Through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Their trespass means riches for the world. Their failure means riches for the Gentiles. Their rejection means the reconciliation of the world. What on earth is he talking about? First of all, let me just say, Gentile simply means non-Jew. That's all it means. Anybody who isn't a Jew is a Gentile. That's it. That's all that he means when he uses the word Gentile. So, What's this mean that through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles? I think you see what he's talking about. If you look in the book of Acts, chapter 15, you see the story of the very first church council, the Council of Jerusalem, which was held in about 50 AD. All of the apostles had to come back from everywhere they were in the world and gather again in Jerusalem to resolve the first theological crisis in the church, the burning issue that threatened to undermine the early church. And what was that burning theological issue? The question was, are we allowed to let Gentiles into the church, or is the church only for Jews? Okay, how far from that have we come today where the question is, is the church for Jews? The question was, is the church for Gentiles? Are Gentiles allowed to be members of the church, or do they first have to become Jews before they qualify for membership in the church? Now, we, we know how wrong this was, of course, and of course, the apostles realized it was wrong, and the ruling was that Gentiles are welcome to enter the church without becoming Jews first. But we can see where this mistake came from, right? Because Jesus was a Jew, all of the apostles were Jews, all of the early disciples were Jews. When Jesus sent out his disciples, he didn't say, uh, you know, go nowhere among the Jews, but go only to the towns of the Gentiles. He said the opposite. He goes, said, go to no towns of the Samaritans and no town of the Gentiles, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. On Pentecost Sunday, when, when uh, uh, St. Peter preached to the crowds and 3,000 entered the church that afternoon, those were 3,000 Jews, right? They were gathered in Jerusalem for the Jewish feast. You know, the, the church emerged very visibly out of Judaism, 
from the Jewish Messiah, from Jesus, being preached by Jews to Jews, how natural to see it as a sect of Judaism, and to raise the question, is this part of Judaism? Is this only for Jews, or is this also for Gentiles? That mistake was quickly eliminated by the very fact that the Jews refused to enter the church, and the people who were entering the church were all Gentiles, so pretty quickly it became apparent that the church was every bit as much for Gentiles as it was for Jews. But how much more of a problem would this have been if those five million Jews in the area around Palestine at the time of Jesus had all entered the church? It would have been much more difficult to see Christianity and the church as meant for the whole world and as not something which at least was meant first and foremost for the Jews and that the Gentiles could be at best second-class citizens. And it would have been a danger for the Gentiles and it certainly would have been a danger for the Jews who would have thought, we own the church and what are they doing here? That whole danger was eliminated by the Jews' rejection of Christ. I think this is what Paul means when he says, when he said, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Their trespass meant riches for the world. Their failure meant riches for the Gentiles. Their rejection meant the reconciliation of the world. The Jews' rejection of Christ meant the reconciliation of the Gentile world, the reconciliation of all of mankind with God through Christianity, which required the Jews' rejection of Christ. Does that make sense? It's really only logical. Um, now, and then Paul goes on with his image of the olive tree, which is his central image of the interplay, the interaction between Jew and Gentile in the church in between the first and second coming. He compares salvation to this olive tree, which was uh, planted, uh, its roots are in Judaism. The olive tree was originally the tree of Judaism. And then I'll go on to his words in, in Romans 11. So he's talking about the olive tree of salvation. And he says, uh, but if some of the branches of this cultivated olive tree were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the richness of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. If you do boast, remember, it is not you that supports the root, but the root that supports you. You will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true, but do not become proud, but stand in awe. For God... Um, for, uh, let me find this. For even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree. So you see the whole story here, right? The tree of salvation is this cultivated olive tree, which was originally Judaism and the Jews. Some of those original cultivated olive branches were broken off. That's the Jews who rejected Jesus. Uh, in order to make room to graft in wild olive branches, those are Gentiles in the church. If you're one of those grafted in wild olive branches, don't boast over the broken off original cultivated olive branches because first of all they were only broken off to make room for you and remember God grafted you into the tree how much more easy how much easier will it be for him to graft them back into the tree because they were originally a part of it and when he does how much better fitted to the tree will they be because they were an original part of it don't shoot me I'm not saying this is St. Paul okay as St. Paul said how much more well, uh, for if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? Okay, so that's this interplay between Jew and Gentile in the church between the first and second coming. The image being that uh, near the time of the second coming, when the full number of the Gentiles has come in, it'll be time to graft back in the original olive branches. That's the conversion of the Jews that has to precede the second coming. And then the church comprised of Jew and Gentile will be ready for the second coming. So let me go on with the end of uh, Romans 11, which talks more about why God arranged salvation history this way, and also talks about the timeline for the second coming. So this is now uh, Romans 11, chap uh, verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As regards the gospel, there are enemies of God, but for your sake. 
but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. Okay, so you see why God did this this way. Um, at the time of the first coming, the Gentiles were, as Paul says, disobedient to God. In other words, they were out of relationship with God. So when they were invited into the church, when they entered the church, it was obvious to everyone that it was a sovereign act of the mercy of God, and it's nothing that they did to deserve it. But the Jews were in relationship with God, so if they had started out in the church, they wouldn't have seen it as a sovereign act of the mercy of God. They would have said to themselves, we deserve this. We were so good. We deserve this all along. You see that in the New Testament, right? That's what the Jews are continually doing, saying, you know, we, we deserve to own God because we're so good. The Jews had to also pass through a period of disobedience so that when they enter the church, it's evident to them also that it's a sovereign act of the mercy of God and nothing that they could have done or any of us could ever have done to deserve the gift that we have of salvation. Right? It's just obvious, really. As Paul says, God has consigned all men to disobedience that he may have mercy upon all. So that is... You know, in 57 minutes, <laughs> the story of Judaism and salvation history. Um, oh, let me actually just say what I said. I promised to say about the timeline, because there's a very interesting phrase here. It might have gone by you. Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and then all Israel will be saved. What is this business about the full number of the Gentiles coming in? Well, we know more about the full number of the Gentiles coming in from the words of Jesus himself in Luke 21. He prophesies over Jerusalem shortly before the crucifixion, and he says, quote, The Jews will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations, and Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And there will be signs and sun and moon and stars and upon the earth distress of nations in perplexity are the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting with fear and with foreboding of what is coming on the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So you see that pretty much that same phrase, um, the, the full number of the Gentiles having come in, the times of the Gentiles having been fulfilled. Jesus is laying out a timeline here. The Jews will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive among all nations. Literally fulfilled in 70 AD, the Romans conquered Jerusalem after the Jews had revolted. They led the Jews away into slavery. They, uh, the Jews were led captive among all nations, literally. Jerusalem will be trodden down by the Gentiles, literally fulfilled. From then on, continually, for almost 2,000 years, Jerusalem was trodden down by the Gentiles, in other words, held in Gentile hands, until 1967 AD, when for the first time in almost 2,000 years, the old city of Jerusalem returned to Jewish hands. Jesus calls this the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled, and then he immediately goes into a description of the second coming, right? Signs and sun and moon and stars, a man fainting with fear and foreboding of what is coming on the world, the powers of the heavens being shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. There will be what's called the great apostasy, uh, the great apostasy, a widespread falling away from the faith. That's another sign to precede the second coming. I don't think it's unreasonable to see all of this and to see it as perhaps a suggestion that we may be near that time in salvation history, which has been described as the times of the Gentiles being fulfilled, the full number of the Gentiles coming in, having come in, a widespread falling away from the faith, which is known as the great apostasy. Another sign that has to precede the second coming, by the way, according to the Catechism of the Council of Trent, is the appearance of the Antichrist. And I'm not supposed to become too political, so I won't talk too much about I won't hypothesize about possible antichrists who might have appeared. Um, I'll leave that to your imagination or to Father to talk about. Um, but anyway, it's, it's not unreasonable to, to think that this is a particular reason why it's about time to care about the conversion of Jews, to pray for the conversion of the Jews, and to make ready for, I hope, in our lifetime. I'm not saying that's true, but I certainly hope in our lifetime, the second coming. So with that kind of a flyby of salvation history, let me close with another, uh, another prayer for the conversion of the Jews. Um, 
Yeah, another prayer for the conversion of the Jews. This is uh, on the back of another prayer card, which I also have for free out of my table. Uh, it's the one with this on the front. It's also a 100% uh, kosher Catholic prayer for the conversion of the Jews, because it's straight from the Catholic breviary. It's from the Catholic breviary uh, for a prayer for the week of Christian unity in January. Day six of prayer for the week of Christian unity is prayer for the conversion of the Jews. It's dedicated to praying for the conversion of the Jews. Um, and this is the prayer from the breviary. Granted, this is uh, the uh, breviary that preceded Vatican II. So I, I'm not sure the form this prayer takes in the new version. But anyway, this is the, the, uh, the prayer from the breviary for the week for Christian unity. Again, I'll read it as a prayer and invite you, if you wish, to uh, silently pray along and to take a, a copy, if you wish. O oh God, who manifests your mercy and compassion towards all peoples, have mercy upon the Jewish race from the outset, your chosen people. You selected them alone out of all the nations of the world to be the custodians of your sacred teachings. From them, you raised up prophets and patriarchs to announce the coming of the Redeemer. You willed that your only son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, should be a Jew according to the flesh, born of a Jewish maiden in the land of promise. Listen to the prayers we offer you today for the conversion of the Jewish people. Grant that they may come safely to a knowledge and love of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah foretold by their prophets, and that they may walk with us in the way of salvation. Amen. Amen and thank you. And um, uh, thank you very much. And I'm, I'm happy to, again, take any questions for 10 or 15 minutes and then to uh, peddle books and DVDs afterwards. Yeah? Uh, the question is, how do I see uh, Islam fitting into salvation history? Uh, first of all, at the risk of sounding like trying to sell, uh, one of my DVDs actually has a, has a talk on it, on the role of Islam in salvation history, available tonight only for only $12. No. Um, um, uh, but uh, basically, uh, first of all, what I'm going to say has to do with the religion of Islam. It doesn't have to do with Muslims, okay? Because if I'm right, then Muslims are the victims of a false religion. They're not, in other words, they're the number one victims of Islam. They are immortal human souls that God created to live for all eternity in bliss with him in heaven, just like everyone else is. And if they're under the influence of a false religion, you know, they're the primary victims of it. So it's in no way a condemnation of Muslims at all. Um, but it is a um, consideration of Islam as a religion. Now, Islam is based on revelation, right? Just like Christianity, just like Judaism. It is supposed to be, it's based on a divine revelation. The story is that Muhammad, who was a um, unschooled, literally illiterate, he didn't know how to read or write, um, kind of gopher for caravans who ended up marrying the woman who owned the caravans and, and you know, leading the caravans. Um, Anyway, at one point he went into a cave and the angel Gabriel appeared to him and gave him the revelation which later became written down by his disciples as the Koran. In this revelation, um, you know, God introduces himself, obviously as Allah, tells um, Muhammad a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff about Judaism, a lot about Christianity, a lot about Jesus, a lot about what God wants for man, a lot about how man should behave and so forth. Everywhere you look, in the revelation that the angel Gabriel was supposed to give, have given to Muhammad, you see what seems to me to be a very direct diabolical counterfeit, aping mimicry of Christianity as it would be if it was the devil who was playing the role of God. Um, for instance, in, in Christianity you have the Great Commission, go out and make disciples of all nations. In Islam you have the Great Commission, go out and make the entire world submit to the law of Islam through conversion, if they choose to convert, but otherwise through the sword, and if they refuse to, if they refuse to go along, kill them. It's the same Great Commission, make everybody a follower of me, but God wants our love and free will, and the devil couldn't care less about that. He just wants power over us and control and our submission. Um, in Islam, it is taught that the idea that God loves us or wants our love is horrible sacrilege, that God should so lower himself to care about whether we love him and that he should, God forbid, love us is a terrible sacrilege. 
Um, uh, again, the devil doesn't care anything about love. All he cares about is submission. Even marriage, marriage in Christianity is elevated to be a picture of uh, man's fidelity to God and God's love for mankind based entirely on free will and, and love. There is no role of free will in Islam at all. For instance, a conversion in Islam, if you recite the magic formula, which has to do, I'm not going to say it word for word, because then I would be under a death sentence for being an apostate from Islam. Because if I said the formula word for word, I would be as much a Muslim as any born devout Muslim. Because all you have to do is say that phrase, and you are entirely Muslim, even if a sword is being held over your neck and you're being threatened with death if you don't say that phrase. That phrase has to do with Allah being the only God and Muhammad being a true prophet. Uh, again, God has infinite respect for our free will. The devil has no respect at all for our free will. Um, heaven, the picture of heaven. Um, the Christian heaven is, of course, the bliss of heaven comes from our intimacy with God and our love and our love from God and our, our uh, experience of God's love and our love of each other. And the, um, the uh, content of heaven in Islam excuse the expression, is, is, you know, is Hugh Hefner's or Ted Turner's picture of heaven, right? The bliss of heaven comes from, from tremendous sexual license and indulgence, 72 virgins and 28 beardless boys, by the way, but that's another story. Um, really. So, you know, it, it seems to me that everywhere you look in Islam, what you see is the devil's caricature of Christianity. I think Islam has a tremendous role to play in salvation history, which is what we're seeing now, because I very literally think it's the religion of the Antichrist. And when you see the story of Armageddon in the, you know, in the Bible, in the prophecy to precede the second coming, of the forces of the Antichrist taking up arms, trying to defeat Christianity, and the final battle being resolved actually by Christ coming again in glory, I think that army of the Antichrist is actually going to be Islam's attempt to eradicate Christianity by force. So that's it in a nutshell. I, didn't want, I hope I didn't offend anybody. Uh, but that's, you know, just... By the way, I've talked about this with a lot of people, including legitimate Islam scholars, um, Catholic Islam scholars, by the way, including, by the way, for instance, Father Mish Pakwa, uh, but others too. And uh, they all agree, although they usually say, I wouldn't say it in public. <laughs> but anyway... Yeah. Um, the Muslims uh, claim to come from the line of Ishmael. Um, that is that's that is true. That is the, their claim. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know to what extent, and I actually, uh, frankly, doubt that there is any um, practical basis for that claim. Uh, what what happened was. Muhammad, when he received this revelation, you know, he leaves the cave, he tries to get a following, he tries to get followers, he tries to basically build up his religion and take over the whole world, by the way, by the force. Um, and the people around him at the time, there were three groups of people around him. There were pagans, there were Jews, and there were Christians, because that's who there were in that part of the world at that time. There were tribes, and a tribe would be a pagan tribe, it would be a Jewish tribe, it would be a Christian tribe. And he tried to sell his new religion to all three groups. And to the pagans, he basically said, let me tell you about the real pagan worship, because what I'm giving you isn't a change in religion. I'm giving you the true version of your religion. He said the same thing to the Jews, that he was giving them the true Judaism, and the same thing to the Christians, that I'm giving you the true form of Christianity. And that's why there are things in the Koran that echo things in Christianity and echo things in Judaism and echo things in paganism. The things that echo paganism in the Koran, he took out when he pretty soon started selling just to Jews and Christians and not to pagans. And the fact that he was actually supporting polytheism became an embarrassment. So he had to erase those verses from the Koran, which became known as the Satanic Verses. You've heard that expression, the Satanic Verses? Because he then later said, by the way, those weren't really the angel Gabriel who gave me those verses. That was a, that was a demonic imitation of Gabriel who gave me those verses. And they became known as the Satanic Verses and were removed. But the verses that said, this is really the real Judaism were left in, and this is really the real Christianity we were left in. And so the way he co-opted Judaism was to say that the Jews perverted the story in the Old Testament. It wasn't Isaac who was the child of promise. It was Ishmael who was the child of promise, which was supposed to be the great you know, seed, the great elect people. And it's them, the Muslims, who are the seed of Ishmael. 
So that was a way for them to um, embed themselves in the promise given to Abraham. That's where I think that kind of line comes from. Um, but anyway, it's not authoritative. Yes? Actually, uh, we are close to the year 6,000 on the Jewish calendar. I think we're like 57, 60-something, somewhere around there. The Jewish calendar starts with creation. It's, uh, it Actually, I think it's an open question whether it starts with the first day of creation or the sixth day of creation. I'm not joking. I actually think that's a theological issue. But in any case, it, it, it begins with creation. Um, it, it's, the dating of the Jewish calendar is pretty close to the dating you would get in the Old Testament if you just added up lifetimes and got back to Adam and Eve. Um, and um, so that's, I guess that's the question. So on the Jewish calendar, Abraham came around the year 2000 and uh, Jesus came around the year two, 4000. It's very interesting to me that in the Talmud, which is the Jewish oral tradition, um, it, says, it says that the world is going to exist for 6,000 years 2,000 years between the creation of the world and the giving of the law, 2,000 years between the giving of the law and the coming of the Messiah, and 2,000 years between the coming of the Messiah and the uh, end of the world. So according to Jewish theology, we're very close to the second coming. It really was 2,000 years between the creation of the world and the start of Judaism, 2,000 years between the start of Judaism and the coming of the Messiah, who is Jesus, and 2,000 years, of course, between the coming of Jesus and where we are now. So it's interesting to me that according to Jewish prophecy, we should be right around uh, the time of the second coming. That's, by the way, one of the reasons if you read the, old, uh, the New Testament, it says somewhere that when John the Baptist emerged, you know, wins his ministry, everyone was going around saying, is he the Messiah, is he the Messiah? Because the Jews were in expectation that this was the time when the Messiah was supposed to be appearing. And so that's one of the sources of that. The other source of that expectation is actually in the book of Daniel. I think it's chapter 9. But there's a very beautiful prophecy in there that dates the coming of the Messiah. It goes through the calendar dating when the Messiah will come from when the temple was rebuilt in Jerusalem. And if you figure out those numbers, it comes out to almost exactly, um, I think, I think it is, it's, within a, it's basically almost exactly when Jesus came that the, uh, the chronology in the prophecy in Daniel dates the day that the Messiah is going to come. So that's why the Jews were in expectation for the coming of the Messiah at the time of Jesus. Really, Judaism makes so much more sense in the light of Christianity. Anyway, I'm selling, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but anyway, yeah? I don't have a good take on them. I have a take, obviously, Pentecost is easy, and, uh, and uh, Shavuos and Pentecost is very easy. Uh, Passover and Easter is very easy. Even Hanukkah and Christmas is pretty easy. Um, uh, I will just say, as a way of sidestepping your question, this year, do you know what day on the Catholic calendar Yom Kippur came on? on no, on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross. So Yom Kippur is the one day when the high priest would offer sacrifice for the remission of sins of the Jewish nation. It's the one day he would enter the Holy of Holies. It's the one day when he would consummate the ultimate sacrifice, and it fell on the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross that, of course, commemorated the, you know, the, the, the true Yom Kippur, the true taking away the sins of not only the entire Jewish nation but of all of humanity. So I thought that was a very nice coincidence, but, of course, that doesn't happen every year. But that's slow. We're just a way to sidestep your question. I don't really have a good a good take on it. Yes. They they are such opposites. The picture of God. I mean, I, I, do I do I have those quotes here? I, I don't have those quotes here. I don't think. But the Quran is full of things like whoever says God had a son has invented a terrible blasphemy. God has no son. The Quran says that Jesus never died on the cross. It says explicitly, it says the, uh, the Jews thought he died on the cross, but really it was a sham. Um, I mean, how you reckon, can reconcile a God who simply wants our submission, and that is a terrible blasphemy to say that he cares about us loving him, you know, with, with Jesus who died on the cross because he cared about nothing but us loving him. Uh, you know, really good luck. I, this is a, we're living in such an age of nonsense. Um, 
you know, anyway, that's my take on it, but I'm, I, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't want to play the role of, you know, kind of negative prophet, but I, I, just, I just can't make any heads or tails sense out of it, except that it's total indifferentism. It's just making garbage of all religion. Jesus will come back to be our punishers? Well, if Jesus were Muslim, he would be coming back to punish us. Yeah. By the way, another Islamic counterfeit of, uh, of Christian doctrine that I find very interesting is I've been talking all evening about how uh, Catholic doctrine says it can't be, the second coming won't happen until there's a conversion of the Jews. According to Islam, the day of resurrection can't happen until all the Jews are killed. Okay, and that's there explicitly. And the, the, the what was his name, Ahmadinejad, the leader of Iran, made allusion to that. The reason why he wanted to exterminate Israel and the Jews was to bring about the day of resurrection. Essentially, the Muslim version of the second coming, uh, the day of resurrection can't happen until all the Jews are exterminated, and he wanted to bring it about, which is why they have to exterminate all the Jews. So again, you see this diabolical mirror image, you know, aping of, of Christian doctrine. Um, anyway, yes? That's a really good question. What's my take on the thousand year reign of peace? And the answer is I am clueless. I'm absolutely clueless. Um, there isn't any true dog, uh, Catholic dogma on that. There's very little dogma on that. And a very wide range of uh, theological opinions are acceptable under the rules of dogma. Basically, Anything that doesn't contradict dogma is acceptable, and there's so little dogma on it that you can't, the, the rapture is not acceptable. Like pretty much everything but the rapture, including that Jesus will return and there'll be an era of peace on earth, or that it's kind of all symbolic, and when Jesus returns, that'll be the final judgment. The full range of opinions is acceptable, and I can make heads or tails out of it. But I'm sure, never mind. I'm sure Father will be able to give you the definitive answer when he, at the end of the evening. <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's 20 past. I'll take one more question and then ask Father to, to close with a prayer, if there is one more question. Yeah? I'll tell you a story which is used. There's something called um, anti missionaries in Judaism. An anti missionary is essentially a Jewish apologist who tries to talk Jews who think Christianity is true out of thinking Christianity is true. So, like, my father wanted me to see an anti-missionary. In other words, when I became a believer in Jesus, it's like, well, you have to talk to a rabbi who can, you know, explain how Jesus couldn't have been the Messiah, and that's what an anti-missionary is. And the standard anti-missionary response is the following. They tell, the, I know one who tells this story. He tells the story. This takes place in... Um, in Eastern Europe, you know, 200 years ago, you know, where the Jews all lived, you know, in Poland and the Ukraine and stuff in these ghettos. So this, these, this guy is walking through the woods and he comes across a tree with a bullseye painted on it and an arrow shot right in the middle of the bullseye. And he says to himself, boy, son, there's some guy around here who's a pretty good archer. And he walks a little further through the woods and he comes across another tree, another bullseye, another target with an arrow straight in the bullseye. And he says, wow, this guy really hits it. He's really good. Comes across another tree and another tree and so forth. And then after about five or six of these trees, he comes across a guy walking with a bow and an arrow and, you know, a quiver of arrows. And he says to him, you know, are you the guy who shot all those arrows into the trees? And the guy says, yes. And he says, wow, you're a really good shot. And he says, good shot, what do you mean? I shoot an arrow into a tree and I paint a bullseye around it. <laughs> and I don't know if you see this point of the story, but basically what the Jewish anti-missionary is saying is, of course Jesus fulfilled all of the prophecies in the Old Testament. This is all fiction, it was all made up. If you're going to make up a story to make Jews think that he's the Messiah, of course you're going to make up the story to fit the prophecies. So that's kind of the standard Jewish answer, and um, it's not a bad one as far as it goes, but the counter answer to that is very interesting that all of these guys who made up the stories chose to be martyred in these incredibly painful ways rather than admit that they made up the story. That's pretty inexplicable. So it doesn't make it to the second stage, but it does a good job of producing a roadblock at the first stage. So that's what a horrible note to end on, but um, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun, and I will be back uh, tomorrow night, and um, I, I'll ask Father to, to close with a prayer again.
In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of salvation. We thank you for this opportunity to learn more of the truth and how you used your Jewish people to bring salvation to us Gentiles. We thank you for the gift of Jesus, the Eucharist, the sacraments, and your blessed mother. As we ask her to intercede for us, as we say together, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you, are you everything ready for this time so you can? Yes. All right. Okay. He wants you to stop by his table. Let's give Roy a big hand.